I first witnessed a drive-by shooting at my aunt's house in Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock is a neighborhood a few miles northeast of downtown LA, where thousands of Filipinos call home. During one particular family party when I was a kid, I was playing with other random kids in the driveway. All of a sudden, I heard gunfire, and then a car screeched down the street. All of the adults rushed to the front of the house to find out what happened. I don't recall the aftermath of the drive-by, but the incident always remained in my mind in every subsequent visit. A few years later, when I was in college, I came home for the weekend to attend a family party, again at my aunt's house. Like the drive-by incident, I was hanging out in front of the driveway. This time, instead of gangsters rolling down the street, it was a young white gay male couple walking their dog in the sidewalk. I overheard their conversation about how the house, my aunt's house, lost its original quote-unquote character. They walked away, and I didn't think much of it until much later. My aunt's home was like many houses in the neighborhood. It was a small wooden California bungalow with a porch, built at the turn of the 20th century. When my aunt and her family moved there in the 80s, they put up a chain-link fence, replaced wood paneling with suburban-style stucco, added makeshift room additions in the back of the house, and of course, erected a Virgin Mary grotto and with the fountain in the front yard. To my aunt, the house had plenty of character, a character of moving to another country and making a home with the resources you had. To others, however, her version of character wasn't enough. It wasn't up to par with certain aesthetic standards and as a consequence, her house supposedly diminished property values. Today, my aunt's house still stands, Virgin Mary still greeting visitors. But the neighborhood has changed. So every time I visit, it will forever be the site where I first witnessed a drive-by and where I first learned about gentrification. My secret, just do something that ain't nobody ever done before, but make it sound like something that's always been there forever. Hello, welcome to This Filipino American Life, a podcast that explores the nuanced experiences of Filipinos in the United States at Ibapa. Uh, my name is Joe Bernardo, and I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts, Ryan Carpio, Elaine DeLullis, and Mike. Yay. Producer Mike, stop being so sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm supposed to be behind the scenes, I don't know why I'm in these episodes. Uh, but people like know you and like say no, hi to I don't, you I don't buy that. No. and like chase after you in the street that was me <laughs> was chasing after that, that did happen at mayday but that was that was, that was see it there happens you you're a celebrity <laughs> uh today we'll be discussing discussing gentrification dun, dun, dun. Dun. Gentrification. What? Gentrification. What? <laughs> gentrification and today we have a guest uh her name is jen ganata uh, she's a housing attorney and community activist. She's a former resident of Los Angeles's historic Filipino town. Woo woo. And woo woo. Um, she came through the organization SIPA, Search to Involve Filipino Americans, and currently also does work with the Filipino Worker Center and other organizations. So, Jen, welcome to our show. Yay. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don't be nervous. It's cool. I'm Don't nervous. be nervous. <laughs> And yes, today we're going to talk about gentrification and really pick Jen's brain about the subject um, that so many people have talked about over the last you know, few couple decades. Well, I mean, especially in LA. And especially in LA. You know, I'm sure in different cities and communities, happens, there's different layers yeah, of this. Happens in er almost every urban city in America going on right now. Um, and how does it affect the Filipino community? Um, so, uh, I guess my first question for you all is, um, when you hear the word gentrification, what do you think of? <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, I think of, I think of my parents and how they wish gentrification would happen to their neighborhood <laughs> because, um, 
I remember when I talked about how gentrification was bad because it makes like poor people leave the neighborhood because they get priced out. My dad was like, "When is this gonna get gentrified here?" <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so that's what I think of. Uh, me, I think of economics. I think of push pull. I think of the pushing out of folks who, um, uh, based on economics, cannot can no longer afford to live um, where they've established themselves. Um, is what gentrification is. I don't know if that's correct, hmm. but yeah. What about you, Joe? When I think of gentrification, I think of resegregation. Okay. So it's kind of <clears throat> a lot of policies that have been passed that um, have benefited those who are rich and um, certain market forces have uh, benefited the rich and um, throughout history we've seen that through uh, whatever um, urban renewal during the 20th century um, and now it's just kind of a different form and it's a resegregation of the inner city you mean a, like resegregation of like so people of color, people of color moving yeah. to uh, <clears throat> other places outside the inner city and um uh my m- m- mainly like you know middle class right. white people and a lot of some asians mm-hmm. many other people of color but they happen to be middle, middle class they move to um certain neighborhoods that are closer to downtown mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um yeah, and you see it when you go to other places, not just Los Angeles. You definitely see it in San Francisco and mm-hmm. um, New York. DC is experiencing it. Yeah. Like, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I think. What do you think, Mike? I mean, it's probably like the purest expression of capitalism, right? Mm-hmm. In which, you know, so we live in historic Philippine town right now. Um, and just kind of seeing how that plays out in a community that was largely, you know, has always been kind of working class, Mm -hmm. although, you know, that's definitely changed over the years, but you know, the most, the most clear expression of it for us is the idea that, you know, there's, there were a lot of empty lots, a lot of, um, you know, just empty space Mm -hmm. in historic Philippine town that all of a sudden seemingly overnight is filled with apartment buildings and housing units that seem well beyond the rent you know, the incomes of the people who essentially currently live in the neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there was just a story not that long ago about a building just down the street from us um, where rents were starting in the 3,000s, right? Oh my yeah. God. Which is more than double what we pay bedroom. for our little, you know, place in the neighborhood. But, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, anyone in the neighborhood who had been there for any extended amount of period of time seeing that as reasonable. Yeah. Like, and so it's, it's, it's a very specific way to bring in new money, new people, and a different class of people than those who are currently in the neighborhood at this moment. Yeah, to live like off Temple and Union and pay three grand, like 10 years ago, I could not even imagine anyone being ballsy enough to say that. Mm -hmm. And now it's like a reality for like some people really consider it. Yeah, there's multiple buildings. I mean, even on our street, there were single family homes uh, that are getting knocked down and turned into multifamily apartment buildings. probably at rent levels that, you know, we would never even consider as mm-hmm. reasonable. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I was just driving through, was it a couple of weeks ago? And I texted you. I'm like, dude, this, there's a whole new development like on this street. Oh shoot. There's another development on temple. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. uh, I, I was just really shocked. I used to drive that every day and, you know, I hadn't in the past few months and I was just really surprised about, you know, what was going on. on, on yeah. Temple it's street. interesting. Cause I mean, some of the empty lots that are now getting turned into apartment buildings were places that, you know, we mentioned uh, Search and Vault Building Americans earlier, SIPA, um, places that, you know, at the time SIPA had imagined would be spaces for affordable housing right. or would try to develop, you know, housing that people in the neighborhood could live in and attract, you know, and stabilize its current residents um, at hopefully a reasonable rate. Um, but now all those spaces are turning into apartment buildings owned by I don't know who, you know, to serve I don't know who um, and changing the neighborhood in ways that I don't think we're going to see you know, immediately, but so, so insidious that, you know, it's, it's not going to feel like our neighborhood in other words. So to me, that's, that's the kind of clearest, you know, demonstration of what gentrification really kind of brings in a practical sense, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think this is new either. Mm -hmm. This is not new. Um, Just in terms of Filipino American history, you know, little Manila's have been kind of dotted the West coast 
<clears throat> since like the 1920s. Um, L.A., Stockton, San Francisco, Seattle, um, and, Se- and San Diego. And, you know, Filipinos have been pushed out of those neighborhoods mm-hmm. um, during the 50s and 60s because of urban renewal. And instead of kind of hipster coffee shops or brand new lofts or anything, it was in the form of freeways and office parks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but currently, gentrification is still affecting the Filipino community. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about historic Filipino town here in, here in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Soma, Pilipinas, south of Market, um, in San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco is actually, f- f- uh, San Francisco Filipino population has decreased 17%. Over 17? Yeah, since Wait, 2000. Wow. Since 2000. Wow. So, um, Are they getting pushed out? Of yeah, like- I mean, yeah, they're, yeah, they're getting, definitely getting pushed out of south of market that area yeah um there are organizations that are trying to uh reverse that or trying to are organizing tenants like sam can and uh filipino community development corporation um those organizations in seattle there's beacon hill um in south part of seattle which is how it's getting gentrified and filipinos are kind of moving out woodside queens you know so um it's affecting filipino americans just as much as any other Mm -hmm. um group So, um, yeah, I was going to ask, like, you know, if do you consider Mike and Elaine, do you consider like the the empty lots that are now no longer empty? Uh, Would you say that's progress? That's a mixed bag. (laughs) It's hard (laughs) because the where we live, there was like an empty lot across the street. And like the only one thing I remember was there was a. There was a tiger stuffed animal that used to like just be in the lot, and I used to like, like across from Sipa. Across from Sipa, yeah. and I used to like fondly think of it like, oh, the tiger, and now it's gone. It's a building <laughs> um, with a coffee shop with a coffee called shop called Drink House, house with a Z. Oh, Z. Oh, no. Yeah, which I thought was like a fake business and was never open, but it is open. Um, is it is it, is um is the store is it written in like all lowercase letters with a period at the end? <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Does it have like a weird? umlaut somewhere <laughs> like I think it does. on a on a on a, a letter that shouldn't have one like the s or the z <laughs> it's like why is that there but i remember just thinking like i'm glad something's there but i'm sad that it had to be like a luxury apartment because um there's a, people who like like me and mike like we can't leave our neighborhood anymore we can't afford to live anywhere um and there's a new building that's on um temple that it's like it's kind of near Fakla maybe but I was sad because I remember like when I was working uh, in the community I was thinking like oh we can make it a community garden like let's make it a community garden and um the person we were trying to talk to was like well it's it might be like it might be turned into commercial use and I was like yeah right like it'll never turn into commercial use and now there's a building there like there's a mixed mixed use um luxury apartment building that hasn't opened yet yeah and like the added layer to that too is to what degree was a community you know engaged in what was happening you know i mean to what degree was a needs assessment done in terms of understanding well you know let's just put this apartment building here and the people will come Mm -hmm. or did they actually ask themselves well you know we should create some space for some like you know small businesses or retail maybe a grocery store because there's no you know real stores like accessible within the neighborhood mm-hmm. other than um, like temple seafood which and adjusting like kind of like the, the the traffic that it adds and kind of the, the strain on you know available parking and things like that i mean you know it's, it's it's a mixed bag because you know for example you know there are new bars and galleries getting set up on the other side of our street you know which is interesting and you know i don't know to what degree some of those are you know, really connecting with the people in the neighborhood. Um, but what I do know is that, you know, now people are parking on our street. There are valley parkers parking on, like, mm-hmm. the curbs and the grass. Mm-hmm. Um, and our neighbors are angry about it and passing around petitions and saying, you know, the people are setting up shop in our neighborhood but not really engaging us in how to connect with us. You know? Yeah, like, there's, they're trying to do a petition in the neighborhood to get uh, permitted parking. I hate oh, wow. And I hate permit permitted park. parking. Explain, explain what it is, Ryan. So permit parking is if you live near a kind of like a commercial corridor um, or even the beach, um, you can petition the city of Los Angeles. I only know about the city of Los Angeles uh, to have um, permit parking district, which essentially allows you as a homeowner or in this case, if you're even if you're a renter, but the homeowner 
uh, to buy their parking spots. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it somewhere. um, If you're familiar with Los Angeles, you'll see it on like uh, uh, residential streets next to Melrose, uh, residential streets in Silver Lake now, um, even Echo Park, for crying out loud. They do it in... um Bel Air or Bel- Bever- yeah. or Westwood near UCLA right, where yeah. I work. Yeah. Actually, or affluent people. Live. Right. And actually, uh, one of the biggest uh, examples of uh, permit or PPDs, permit parking, is is during the OJ trial in Brentwood because they wanted to keep the paparazzi from parking on the oh. streets. Anyway, so you'll see those, um, and I hate them. <laughs> I hate them <laughs> because it's totally like if you if you don't because you don't have, like. You guys as renters, for example, you get don't you don't even have a say in that. It's your property owner that actually has a say in, in a lot of that. Um, but that's that sucks, and also it divides people who are able to pay for parking, right? Totally. Yeah. So, which another discussion itself, but okay. Yeah. That's what PPD is. So, um, question to you all, including Jen: mm-hmm. uh, Where did you grow up, and has your neighborhood seen any demographic changes? Who wants to start? Mike? Tag, you're it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm kind of a bad example because I'm from Oxnard, which is like, you know, solidly working in middle class. And so, you know, and we don't live where we used to live. But I, what <clears throat> the only thing that really changed was that, um, you know, they started building a lot more dense housing. Um, whereas it used to be kind of like widely spaced kind of lots of housing. And I think it was affordable at the time. Um, everything kind of went to like kind of the townhouse model, which you'll see in kind of the outlying exurb areas mm-hmm. um, to to kind of like pack more people into kind of smaller lots. Um, so I really, you know, the only real changes, I think, in a place like Oxnard, which isn't like a major city, it's kind of, a you know, a small town, um, is that, you know, they, they build a lot of these things with very, you know, with national kind of retail chains. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's kind of, almost kind of like, you know, if you're going to move to Oxnard, guess what? You get to move to Oxnard and live next to a Target attached to your house or something, you know? <laughs> um, and so that's been kind of the model is that, like, we'll build the mall and housing around the mall. Yeah. Um, which is not that different. Uh, you know, it's happening in different neighborhoods in L.A., but um, it's very centered on the idea that, you know, you're, you're moving to a place uh, that's so designed to community. kind of, yeah, plan communities, those kind of things. And so, you know, very different from what we're experiencing, I think, in the city of L.A., but mm-hmm. um, it's just expressed in a different way and attracting a different group of people for sure um and i would almost yeah venture to say the folks that are moving to the suburbs these days are people that are kind of escaping the fact they can't afford rent in the cities um but i don't know if by building these planned communities if they're really integrating into the city itself mm-hmm. and if they're interacting with kind of the working class core uh, that really makes up you know the heart of the city so mm-hmm. yeah so i grew up here in the in the suburbs, <laughs> the valley, <laughs> the valley, um, yeah. I grew up in kind of suburb uh, suburbia, and I have seen demographic changes, but it's kind of reverse gentrification. <laughs> so that's why I call it like resegregation because um, this house where we're recording, um, my parents said we were the only non people of color in the in the in the neighborhood, and now like there's only like one one household that's white. Everybody mm-hmm. else is uh um, family, immigrant family of color, mm-hmm. um, mainly Koreans, Filipinos, and Indians and um, Armenians. I mean, oh no, Persians. Persians. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my neighborhood. Um, yeah, and just I find it interesting mm. uh, the different demographic shifts that's going on in this neighborhood. Because mm-hmm. like everybody, I you know, for the past how many years, people have always called the suburbs like the lily white suburbs mm-hmm. um but it's definitely changing for sure yeah how about you right i grew up in uh, atwater village uh in los angeles um, hot water hot, hot, hot water. water village um and it's probably a, a good example of 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 a completely drastic change in demographic i just don't a lot of my f- friends i grew up with you know um have moved out of atwater village uh we have a farmer's market now you do you know it's very um, popular we have uh you know celebrities hanging out in that water village and um celebrities just, yeah i know i know really yeah mm. and um so the on the economics uh sense like you know the the business corridor has definitely become more active 
You got um, a Dunkin' Donuts. But I got to tell you something, man. <laughs> Active doesn't necessarily like. I I struggle to f- sometimes find like people of color, and I I always walk around. I'm like, man, we're all we're all you know, because that's we're growing up. There's Filipinos and Latinos in that neighborhood. That's mm-hmm. that's my classmates. Those were uh, the folks I hung out with. Um, uh, played baseball with, you know, climbed fences with, etc. Um, but it's just tagged the window, tagged the walls. No, I would never break do that. windows. No he, way. He, I was weren't you kid. living in these streets, Ryan? No, that's, that's in the Philippines. Like, no. Were you dancing on the corner on cardboard? I, mean, like, I don't think that was Ryan's life. <laughs> no. Uh, but it's definitely changed um, a lot, and uh, you know, we talk about it too. We just, you just kind of feel the changes too, mm-hmm. and so yeah. Um, How are you leaners? So I grew up in North, it's a neighborhood called North Hills now, but when I was a child, it was originally called Sepulveda. You love that. (laughs) Sepulveda. Sepulveda. (laughs) Um, And uh, they changed it to North Hills in an effort to up property value Mm -hmm. because to be honest, like it was a middle-class neighborhood. And then after the plant left the Van Nuys GM plant left Mm -hmm. in the 90s the demographics change from white to people of color majority people of color and so my townhouse complex which was like majority white we were like the lone Filipino family there there was like one black family in the back and there was like a lot there was like intimidation by some of our neighbors like um my dad had a confrontation not really a confrontation but he just kind of like stood his ground when a dude had like a confederate flag up in his garage wow. so that's what it looked like before the plant closed mm-hmm. and then the plant closed and everybody left like it was literal white flight mm-hmm. the neighborhood changed um it became lower middle class um more working folks and i feel like those people all moved to like santa clarita valley or Mm -hmm. um, simi valley they just they moved to where there were more white people and my parents they dug their heels and they're still there they'll never leave (laughs) that's their home and their base um but like the other pockets of the neighborhood like of the valley that i grew up in like van nuys um and arlita it's the same story like it was it used to be white yeah. and now it is not white. Yeah. So similar to you, Joe, where like mostly people of color now live in those neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jen. So my parents um, and I, we first started off in historic Filipino town. Our house was um, by the 101 freeway on the corner of Bellevue and Benton way. Uh-huh. It was torn down a year ago. It was and a pink house. It was a pink house. Mm-hmm. And, since then, there are now two fourplexes that mm. exist there, and they're rented out. And when I drive by, because sometimes I drive by or I bike by, um, all the all the cars have different license plates from out of state. Oh, wow. Um, but after leaving historic Filipino town, my parents moved to Eagle Rock. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess, actually, it was Glass Hill Park at the time. It okay. got rezoned later on back into Eagle Rock. Hmm. Um, since then, I found out that the, the neighborhood's actually called the East Ridge Estates, and it was built in the 1960s. So mm-hmm. most of the houses that are there have, I think there are only four model plans. Um, my brother actually purchased a house up the street from my parents, but my parents, their house was built in the 80s, so it's not mm-hmm. the same floor, mount, floor plan. Um, I say, I, sorry, I always think of Lion Estates, like in Back to the <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> sorry. But the, the house itself, it's, it's behind the Iraq Plaza, so it's on the hill, it's mm-hmm. in New York, and it's kind of like Glass Hall Park. Um, the reason why we moved there was my aunt, not, not by blood, but like, you know, like family relation. It was like my mom's classmate in nursing school in the Philippines. She had a house up the street, and so I think... When my dad passed the boards to be a doctor, um, they ended up purchasing the home because, Mm. like, previous to that, because of uh, where our house in historic Filipino town is situated, like, somebody had driven through the wall, like, the the front yard, and so my mom was kind of like, maybe we shouldn't live here anymore. (laughs) So, they moved, Uh we moved, and I ended up, of me and my siblings, I'm the one who probably grew up in Iraq most of the time, so Mm. my brothers kind of bounced between historic Filipino town, Harbor City, and Detroit. Hmm. 
um, because my dad was doing his residency in Detroit. My mom was still working at the Queen of Angels, which okay. is now the Dream Center. Yeah. And that's actually why we lived in Benton Ways, because she didn't have a car. So she would walk to work. Oh, my sister was born there. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So it's, it's interesting because my mom lived in the neighborhood like mm-hmm. since she came to the States in 1968. Um, she gave me some of her old records and it says like her name, Victoria Villanueva. Mm-hmm. And her address is on Bellevue. So she lived in an apartment that still exists to this day. Uh, that's where she lived, in controlled mm-hmm. apartments. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, right now we're actually going to take a break. All and right. uh, we're going to get more into the issue of gentrification. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Yes. Do you have to fill prescriptions every so often? Yes. Unf- I don't want to divulge in what kind of... Yeah, you don't have to tell me what they are. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's my Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Is that no. covered by insurance? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I do have some pills and vitamins and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I'm lucky that like, I would be able to go to like uh, my HMO because that's what I have. Mm-hmm. But like, what do you think about... If I could, I would go to like a small mom and pop pharmacy. They really exist? I think uh, so. Huh. Where? Where's a good one? Uh, I think Example? there's one in Fontana. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard about that one. It's called A1 Care Pharmacy. A1 Care Pharmacy. Fontana. A1 yeah. Care Pharmacy. Uh, they're open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they're a mom and pop? Yes, mom and pop shop. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. They're, fa- they're actually Filipino owned, mm-hmm. family owned, and operated. If I lived in Fontana, I would totally get my prescriptions filled there and get that personal service. Exactly. And it's actually run by Abby, who's the pharmacist, and Sherwin, who is a good friend of the podcast. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So if anytime you're in Fontana, or you don't even have to live in Fontana, you could live wherever you want and... Uh, <laughs> The pills that get shipped to wherever you are in California. Oh, right? what? Yeah. yeah. They'll even ship it. Yeah. Joe, <laughs> I'm just saying. Maybe your Viagra, your Viagra <laughs> can get shipped to you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, does A1 Pharmacy like have a website? Yeah, it's A1CarePharmacy.com. Awesome. A1 yeah. Care Pharmacy.com? A1 Care Pharmacy.com. <laughs> awesome. A1 Care Pharmacy.com. <laughs> or you could call them 909 821 3600. And if they're not there, you can leave a voicemail like you do for the T file hotline. <laughs> <laughs> cool. cool. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to the show. Hope you Welcome en- back. Hope you enjoyed that short commercial. <laughs> <laughs> awesome commercial. <laughs> we were talking earlier about gentrification, um, and we want to bring on Jen Ganada, who is a housing rights advocate, um, community activist, etc. cetera. And um, yeah, we wanted to talk more deeply about gentrification and that issue and how it affects you know, Filipino Americans. Um, so how do you define gentrification? Um, I actually think that my definition of gentrification is a combination of Mike's and I think yours. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it's it's market-based, specifically. It has a lot to do with capitalism. Um, And the things that you see on the everyday, the movement of people and the switching over of businesses, it doesn't happen overnight, though. I would disagree with Mike's statement about that. It is a longer plan. Mm -hmm. So all the developments you've seen they had to get permits at some point. Yeah. So it's part of it's part of a vision as to what the what the city kind of prioritizes and allows for permits because the city has to allow for permits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but gentrification in and of itself, I I really think that it's it's the displacement is necessary in order to keep the market kind of going. Mm-hmm. So land speculation is just kind of gambling mm-hmm. on this level where you don't know like a market is hot. So while we were talking about our neighborhoods and where we grew up, I was like kind of Googling and, and looking up Zillow, how much my parents' house in Igorok costs. Um, currently, it costs $1.2 million. She. What? what? And it's considered a very hot community. Yeah. Like in Igorok over there. Um, and it's and I can see it. I, I don't think it was ever like, oh, there were a lot of Filipinos in that neighborhood. I think it was mostly affluent or middle class white folks. Mm-hmm. And it still is, except now the couples are my age and they're walking up and down the streets with their dogs and their baby strollers, which mm-hmm. is like I didn't see growing up. Right. 
which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but it's part of that movement to for folks who want to live closer to downtown, but around the city core. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of like an urban suburbia in in that part of Eagle Rock specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a specific gender like just a succinct definition for gentrification, but I, I do think that it's tied with the way that we conceptualize what the city should be. And I think before cities used to be where lots of people can live, and now I think you're you're seeing more what's profitable are the gilded cities. Mm -hmm. The cities where you have a lot of amenities for a lot of rich people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the city makes money off of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think it, it really, and then the intersectionality plays into that part because it's like who doesn't have money, it tends to be people of color, mm -hmm. um, low income working class people of color. Mm -hmm. And so then this is where race and class just sort of intersect and you see the push out. Um, and historic Filipino town is really interesting in that you're seeing gentrification in just kind of just aggressive all over the city though. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the issue also with historic Filipino town is that you did have a lot of people who were mom and pop landlords and it's like they're taking cash buyouts from people for their property. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not, there's no conversation as to what does a community mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, you could talk about that in Boyle Heights. You could talk about that in Highland park. That's mm -hmm. basically what's happening in other cities throughout the mm -hmm. country yeah. and other cities yeah. throughout the country. This is replicated in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did you get into like, you know, ha housing rights advocacy? So I'm going to start by saying that I do work in a nonprofit. So any of the views that I'm saying are my own views and okay. has nothing to do with whatever, whatever nonprofit I'm associated with. The unsaid nonprofit. Yeah. Um, so Voldemort. I actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a staff attorney at inner city law center. So I do work in, in Skid Row currently. Um, but I, I started off working at an eviction defense network. So when I started law school, I ended up um, working doing environmental justice work. And then I went to UCLA to get my LLM and then I needed a job. And Elena Pop at Eviction Defense Network needed an attorney and I was already barred, so I got hired. Mm -hmm. And I just started doing eviction defense work straight, just doing that. Just um, I was there for maybe two and a half years, almost three years. Mm -hmm. Did you have kind of like a personal interest in it? Um, I think, so when I was in law school, I actually did public defense work. So I was interested in the legal services and the direct legal services, but I also was interested in how housing affects communities. Mm -hmm. And it, it made sense because it was, it, it kind of whetted like my interest in public defense work and my interest in environmental justice work. And it, you know, that's all in housing, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we kind of touched upon like, uh, the signs of gentrification, right? Like coffee shops, <laughs> lofts, mm -hmm. um, young couples walking their dog, right? <laughs> well, um, even for me, it's like seeing seeing white people like walking in the neighborhood at night. Yeah. That to me, I'm like, oh, what's happening? What's happening here? Where are they going? <laughs> well, actually, I have a question because mm -hmm. Mike and Elaine, you're not sure. from historic. Yeah, Filipino so town. we can technically we are sort of gentrifiers, right, Mike? Uh, sort what? of isn't that problematic <laughs> i mean because we're not from there um yeah yeah i mean we came in at a very specific time um in which it was affordable to be there mm -hmm. and now it's not and so you could almost say that we were part of some certain wave of you know professional class you know people of color mm -hmm. um that actually there were a couple people that we knew moving into the neighborhood at the time mm -hmm. most of which have moved out at this point but i mean we're still there because we can still afford it mm -hmm. um but yeah i, I, I haven't really thought about that aspect of it, but maybe. Because we lived there during grad school, mm -hmm. and then, you know, typical school situation, you would leave, but we just never left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, that would be considered, if you were to look at, if you lived around USC, you would be considered a gentrifier, right? Oh, totally. Like if you were yeah. in grad school, and you stayed, and you were still there, um, I mean, I think, like, when we're talking about gentrification, there usually tends to be two groups of people. The group of people were like, these are the terrible capitalists who just take advantage of a bunch of people, but I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm in this neighborhood, so mm -hmm. I, and I'm interested in the community. Theoretically, you're still a gentrifier. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. because you are here because somebody needs you to be here and pay, help pay their mortgage or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think the, the, the bigger part of, so I look at downtown LA as an example of this. So I think we're at the third 
just of when all, all the luxury lofts were built and all the adap- like adaptive reuse stuff happened. Um, adaptive, can you explain that? Real so quick? like a lot of the old buildings in downtown LA were not ever used for housing. Mm-hmm. And then um, they passed a lot of different land use things and, and zoning things in mm-hmm. order to turn those buildings that used to be like bank buildings into luxury lofts. Mm-hmm. So I think there's actually, this is like, you know, the first class might have been the artists who were living down there. Then mm-hmm. there were the more professional people. And now it's just like the uber rich, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're at the third level of it. Um, where I've I've actually heard at different bars, just being in the bar, it's like somebody who's an architect is like, I've been living here for five years and now I can't afford it and I have to leave. I can't believe these people are gentrifying <laughs> me out of downtown, which is crazy because I'm just like, what? Okay. But it makes, I mean, that does make sense though, because it's like, you're always feeling... I think they're like, um, I don't remember who actually talks about it as the metaphor. It's like a ladder and gentrification requires the lowest class to Mm kind of just get pushed down. Mm -hmm. Um, And that tends to be the really extremely low income. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at historic Filipino town, what I've been seeing, I've been working on a building in historic Filipino town and those folks have been living there, some of them for 40 years Mm -hmm. and they pay for one bedroom some of them pay less than $500. Wow. And the new landlord purchased the property and wanted, you know, wants everybody out. And you see this all over Mm -hmm. like historic Filipino town, Echo Park, Mm -hmm. Silver Lake, anywhere, cash for keys. But like there's an ordinance in the city and there's supposed to be protections, but no one really explains it to you. And nobody at the housing department can really like um, enforce it, which is problematic. And so what you end up happening having is like people signing things because they don't know what their rights are and mm-hmm. then they end up moving and then they can't live in the city of LA anymore. And now you're going to lose basically all the folks that are considered low income or working class and, but which the city really requires, which is, I don't, you know, at this point and what we're going, if we don't deal with affordability issues, we're going to lose all those folks. Like mm-hmm. we could build as much affordable housing as we want now. It's not going to be built soon enough. Mm-hmm. So how did you get involved in that case? Um, It's really interesting. Well, okay. I had a building on Reno Street with a landlord that I had been sort of fighting with for several months. Um, The case was getting dismissed pretty soon. um, But I saw problems in just kind of what the litigation was going towards. It was uh, a tenant habitability plan, which is a form that's filed in the city and it there you have to follow all these rules basically and there was a town hall forum at in historic filipino town and mike fuhrer was there and i thought to myself mike fuhrer is a city attorney yeah city (laughs) attorney so i was like i'm gonna go there and i'm gonna ask him point blank what are you doing about like what you know these like small landlords who are like doing this and pushing people out well Basically, Mike Fuhrer was like, you know, we deal with more slum lords. We, we don't really handle that at the city attorney's office. You know, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. But you can do X, Y, and Z, which is kind of like, well, that's what I've already been doing. Nobody's taking any affirmative steps towards this. And a tenant actually heard me. And then he pulled out his paperwork and he said, my brother, he's been bedridden for like the past year. And they're accusing him of nuisance and he needs to move. He pays 250 And this is on the street that's on the other side of where Mike and Elaine live. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I know where that street is. And he's like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do because he's saying that he has to move and he's going to be evicted. And then I look at the landlord. The landlord is the same guy that I've been dealing with on on Reno Street. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, let me look into this. So that's kind of how this happened. And then a new landlord switched over. And then it's kind of, it's just, but the new landlord now was the property manager at the time when the first lawsuit went through. Mm, mm. Um, but that's how I got involved because it was like, you know, no one's going to help these people. And are they Filipino? No, it? they're no. Latino. But like I've helped, I mean, there are Filipinos. I had a case in historic Filipino town um, off of Bonnie Bray and in between Temple and Beverly. Mm. There are like four octogenarians basically. And so they're in their 80s. There are two of them are widows of Philam vets from World War II. And they're living off of SSI and that's it. Um, Their landlord had purchased the property and then didn't tell them what their rights were and was raising the rent to like $2,400. It was like a, a, it's like a really crappy, like four, three bedroom. Mm -hmm. And it's in terrible condition. It had like bed bugs, it had rats, et cetera. And they had like their, you know, their friends from the Philippines living in the living room, which they can, they can do that if they want to. And then the, you know, after we're going through the lawsuit, 
the landlord was saying, well, now we have to charge for all these additional occupants. And I was like, no, they're protected under rent control. They've always had all these people. You've always accepted rent. You can't raise their rent. There's illegal rent increases. But I realized that nobody was helping these folks either. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know who to talk to because there really isn't an organization for them to go to in historic Filipino town to help them. And I've seen a lot of that. I've seen um, a building down the street from Bahay Kubo. We're in litigation currently. um, But... I've been just trying to like pick up cases in historic Filipino town when I see them because I know that it's not necessarily covered by any nonprofit organization in the area in terms of tenants rights or advocacy. Can you talk more about that too, actually? Cause you know, in dealing with especially like older elderly Filipinos, I mean, what are some of the bears that they face specifically? Um, and you know, what, what, what would we need to, to kind of address that? So in, in there, in my client's situation, I think, they didn't know what lease they ever signed. They don't remember if they signed a lease. I think when they moved in, you know, their husbands still live there. Um, and they didn't know that you could go to the housing department. Mm-hmm. They don't know who to talk to. They, they don't, they themselves don't have a social worker. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they're in the system at all. Like I think they were, yeah, they were all citizens and everything, but they just didn't know what any of their rights are. They didn't have any kids that were like my age or like grandchildren, my age to explain to them what they're supposed to do. And, they weren't, it didn't seem like they were part of any like church or anything that could like kind of provide them any information. Um, and I've seen it on the flip side. I've seen like Filipino landlords who are kind of the worst and the hardest to deal with because they're like, this is my property. These people should leave. Right. I'm just like, but you're a landlord yeah. and you signed up to do this and there are rules and there are laws. And I'm sorry if this upsets you, but maybe you shouldn't have been a landlord mm-hmm. if you didn't know that this is a risk, right? You don't know what someone else is going to do either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in general, when we're talking, there are, I've actually helped, like, helped a lot of folks who are, um, you know, caregivers that live in historic Filipino town and they're bed spacers. And bed spacing is something that happens in the Philippines. And bed spacing is not typically legal here in LA. Can you explain bed spacing? So it's like you have you basically rent a bed Mm -hmm. in it so it's an illegal boarding house you don't have a roommate and it's like kind of like subdivided with curtains and things like like that like a dorm Mm -hmm. type situation no dorms are probably nicer yeah it's nicer yeah so like i had um like um master of none you know that yeah the i love new york episode yeah or the african Im- taxi drivers they were all shared their, one apartment and yeah. they had like beds yeah oh like mono you know mono yeah mono so there was yeah, like yeah. so one actually it's funny because one of one of them was a member at pwc so he had seen me a couple times so he knew what to do when i was like telling him but he was trying to help people in the unit and there was an elderly man and he was like in his 80s i think he also was a vet but I don't know what happened to him. Like, he just kind of fall through the cracks. Like, I, I would try to find out, like, you know, is he getting services? Did he get his benefits? You know, they're trying to put him in, 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 tact, or in touch with, like, the different services he can have. It's just, I, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, like, not, like, kind of asking around where you should get help or uh-huh. how to get help mm-hmm. or who you should talk to. So, in a lot of times, when I'm meeting a lot of the Filipino clients I ever or meet like one they're always surprised that I'm Filipino like you're Filipino no way (laughs) and so and then they're like automatically like oh let me tell you about this this and that um and I've actually you know because I don't have like some I I understand fluently but I can't speak to them so I'll call my dad or I'll call my mom can you like can you interpret for me and they're like what are you doing (laughs) why are you doing this (laughs) because I mean who else am I gonna call sometimes I call PwC can you interpret for me because I need to explain to them you know what's going on Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me because I never had grandparents, but it's it's hard for me to see that like there isn't anyone who's who's doing this outreach, and they are in such a small population or group grouping in historic Filipino town. Like no one really sees them, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that's really frustrating for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I you talked about earlier, but um, you know, in many instances, Filipinos and other kind of POCs are. Not just you know victims of gentrification, but also contributors to gentrification. Like you talked about the Filipino landlord, um, or homeowners who rent out to people um, in neighborhoods who um, um, who are just you know slumlord landlords, or not even slumlords, but just want the higher profit of yeah. of more middle class or professional class uh, people moving in, um, or even like 
young professionals who are just they need a place to live and they move into neighborhoods where they can afford and that happens to be um you know low income neighborhoods uh you know what's your you know what do you say to that so i know that there's um i also sit on the board for the beverly vermont community land trust Mm -hmm. um and a community land trust is like sort of a different model to deal with affordable housing. And um, the the hope of a community land trust is that the land remains affordable in perpetuity because of the way it's split up, it's a little bit more complicated. Mm-hmm. But when I think about, I'm sorry, when I think about historic Filipino town, I, I, I'm i pretty sure, like I don't know if anyone's done this data, but the probably the vast majority of people are mom and pop landlords Mm -hmm. in that area. They're not like big developers. Um, If we're talking about preservation of historic Filipino town, I think it would be residents kind of talking to the folks in historic Filipino town who are older. Would you like to like sell to us? Like if you had a nonprofit theoretically Mm -hmm. or a land trust, would you like to sell to us because we would like to preserve this community? And uh, you know, like we can pay you the amount that's obviously not the amount that's speculative but it would be an amount that you can have and you could still remain here until, you know, basically pass. And mm-hmm. then, you know, that you'll, will be good in, in that sense, but you would also be helping kind of preserving the community. That's like a level of organ, organizing that I don't know. I don't like, because I think what people hear is the cash value mm-hmm. that you get, get for your land immediately. Mm-hmm. And they don't, because we don't have a really great sense of community in general. And I would say that for all of LA, mm-hmm. um, it's hard to tell a landlord, why don't you do this for the greater good of your community right. if you don't have maybe relationships to mm-hmm. it. But I mean, that's like something that we could do that would maybe stem displacement. Well, well, have you had interactions with, you know, Filipino landlords and had that conversation or, you know, tried to appeal to kind of their sense of community? I mean, how do you, do you think there are cultural barriers to that or or is that even a conversation that people are willing to have? I mean, I don't even think it's just like Filipino landlords Mm -hmm. because this could be any group of people like tens. People who tend to own property don't live in that neighborhood anymore unless it's like Mm -hmm. kind of like your landlord or somebody Mm -hmm. like a lot of these people don't live in this neighborhood anymore. Maybe they live in West Covina. Maybe they live Mm -hmm. in like Chino Hills or or somewhere in the valley Mm -hmm. and they have this property and they're getting income off of it. So I think that's hard for them to be like, why would you, why would I sell this if I could just pass this on to my like kids and they could pass it on to their kids and it would always be an asset that would go, you know, like Mm -hmm. because it, it would have to transcend just your immediate family. It right. would have to like be like, this is about the space right. that is created. And I imagine most people who, who own property, who decide to buy property, right, are investing in it. So their their mind's always going to be on profit or, or the, the longevity of their investment and how much money it can make them in the future. Um, yeah, I mean, how many of us would ever sell, like if we own property, how mm-hmm. many of us would sell it for... Right. Not a profit, right? Right? right. Yeah, not yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I guess it goes to kind of yeah the larger question. I mean, in terms of you know you know recentering again around the Filipino community. I mean, and seeing how that's kind of playing out, and you know one of the dynamics. I guess I don't know if it's unique to LA or if this is true in other major cities. You know, you know as Filipinos kind of leave the core of ethnic enclaves, you know, is there still a deeper connection back to kind of those communities if that's where they originated and is there a responsibility there in any way mm. to on mm-hmm. going both ways to kind of connect. So again, you know, Jen, Jen's family having formerly lived in historic Philippine town and left it, you know, for different places. Um, you know, there are probably many other families that are like that, that have moved out to places like yeah. Eagle Rock, Carson, the other yeah. kind of major Filipino centers where, but if you go back into the kind of the narrative of Filipino American migration within Southern California, a lot of it starts in the downtown area, you know, Bunker Hill, yeah. Filipino town, et cetera. Um, is there something that we need to do to facilitate that conversation? I mean, or like, do people, are you asking like if people have still have an emotional yeah, tie? Yeah. And, and there's, that? there's, is, 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 is there a responsibility? Is there an emotional uh, tie? Is uh-huh. that something we should look at as a priority? I mean, you know, a conversation we had, separate from this was the idea of, you know, why is it called historic Filipino town, not just Filipino town? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's because it's, it's, it was a Filipino town in memory. Yeah. But to what value is that memory to the larger Filipino community in LA and beyond? Right. So, mm-hmm. and, and go ahead. Oh, sorry. So, I mean, just looking at migration patterns of Filipinos, like mm-hmm. Filipinos, they're more likely, um, not more likely, but a lot of Filipinos who do move out 
like uh, happily move out yeah. of like that neighborhood or um, or in San Francisco, for example, they move to like other places in Daly City or, you know, you know, they have they used to have an apartment like in the inner city and then they move to they actually buy property in the suburbs Somewhere else, and yeah. like, they're they're happy. Um, and that's what historic Filipino town exactly, was, yeah, you know, yeah. it was like a. Uh, we talked about it. Uh, a welcome recently. hub. Yeah, a welcome hub. Like yeah. St. Columban is mm-hmm. a church in historic Filipino town yeah. that was founded because Filipinos weren't able to go to church um, in the neighborhood, right? Is that mm-hmm. correct, Joe? You did the research oh, on that, right? Uh, because no, because they, they, yeah, they, they were denied. Um, yeah, there was like problems going down to regular Catholic church. To regular church, Catholic so, church, yeah. so they created their own church. Yeah, back in the 40s. So... Um, but then those the, pe- the generations after that, those Filipinos, like they moved out to mm-hmm. San Gabriel Valley. They moved out to the burbs, even to Eagle Rock, like you, you know. Right, but not, not even like even now, a lot of Filipinos don't even move to like Daly City or Eagle Rock because those are getting priced out too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're going yeah. to the suburbs and then moving the, to like other a, suburbs. The outer, the, the, the exurbs. Yeah. Exurbs. Yeah. So like for... We're going to end up in Oxnard. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> or California City or something like that. So just to give you some, I guess, statistical facts, uh, one of the fastest growing areas of Filipinos in Southern California is Rancho Cucamonga. What? That's yeah, so Since 2000, far. Filipino population grew 70%. Holy cow. What? Yeah. Marietta... That's way out there. Yep. Um, Where is that? It's kind of in between here in San Diego. But Holy like in, cow. Yeah. Uh, I forgot the percentage, but it was like over 100%. It's wow. like, it's like kind of, isn't it a little bit north of like Temecula? Yeah. Like around oh. near the casino. Did somebody build like, yeah, a casino? <laughs> is it near Valley View? Or, uh, it's near Pachanga. or a hospital? Near Pachanga. A Navy base, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Air Force Base? <laughs> <laughs> and in, in, in Northern California, the high, the um, Stockton, was like uh, well, Stockton grew its Filipino population by forty one percent. So people are moving back there. No, well, people are getting priced out, priced out of the, oh, Bay, the area, Bay Area, so they're moving oh. to Stockton and Tracy in that area. Oh, Tracy! I, oh, I, and yeah. Hayward. Or well, Hayward is always part Hayward's of Hayward's already too Vallejo. expensive. Oh, yeah, Vallejo. Vallejo. That area is expensive. But even like the traditional like Filipino enclaves like Daly City, yeah, Hayward. Vallejo, <laughs> uh, Eagle Rock, like it's getting though, priced out. Yeah, the, the Filipino population aren't isn't growing there. They're getting priced out. So is this trend, like we're naming California, but Joe, yeah. being well, a historian, Seattle. you know? <laughs> yeah, <in> Seattle. <laughs> Seattle, people are getting pushed out of Beacon Hill. They're moving to a place called Renton. Oh, wow. In um, New York, in like in New Jersey? Like yeah, New in Jersey, New Jersey, like, Bergenfield, uh, New Jersey. People uh, are getting priced out there. People too. are getting priced out of Woodside, Queens, and... Manhattan. There wasn't a lot of Filipinos yeah. in Manhattan in general, but in Chicago, businesses were getting gentrified in Manhattan, like mm-hmm. Elvis Toro Toro and oh. like these kind of traditional Filipino like businesses yeah. that like also serve as centers. There, where is it? Out. Where are Filipinos in Chicago? Like what neighborhood? Skokie. Is Skokie. Oh. They're, they're in the burbs. That's burbs. Yeah, gosh. yeah. But yeah, um, just to give you sense that it does affect us all. Um, another question I had for you, Jen, is. What about like young Filipino professionals like our age? <laughs> We're very young still, right? Totally, um, totally young. <laughs> who, you know, want to move into these neighborhoods or want to open up quote unquote hip businesses oh. in this neighborhood or like uh, <laughs> people who are involved in that? A, a fancy salog place, you know? <laughs> yeah, for people who are involved fancy in fancy log. Uh, a tender white bar, you know? I want to name a restaurant fancy log. <laughs> We the quote unquote like you know Filipino food movement um, they would be businesses. the creative class <laughs> <laughs> okay can you explain that um, I mean it, it it's hard right like yeah. it's hard for me to actually yeah. conceptualize I feel like I've been doing nonprofit work since college uh-huh. and so I don't really I don't really I don't have any entrepreneurial sense in mm-hmm. me so I think that's that's the thing about being an entrepreneur right like folks want to capitalize on what the moment is right now but i think that like there are different models right like you know john eric and the folks mm-hmm. at parks finest mm-hmm. are, are about like reinvesting in the community mm-hmm. and i think you can you can have community economic development that does show that so but but it requires you to kind of be like hey i'm your neighbor i'm here i'm also creating food that you can come and participate and partake in mm-hmm. it's not just cat like catering because it's like an ethnic type of food 
come to this thing. Like, I would like you who also live in this neighborhood to be able to like afford this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think when folks are coming into neighborhoods that are low income, they should really think about how that's going to impact the actual residents there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like build community with the community yeah. they've yeah. come to. I mean, I think that's, that's the thing is like, I don't think anyone's saying no one should like make money off of anything. Like obviously people have to pay their bills and do stuff and you have to like, reinvest into the community but it is really meaningfully reinvesting into the community it's not mm -hmm. just charitable work it's like mm -hmm. you know um you are part of this community fabric and what makes you part of the community fabric is is doing community events or um having food that people can pay for mm -hmm. and actually you know eat and not just like catering to hopefully getting fancy people mm -hmm. or people who can write about to come out it's actually being like hey mm -hmm. i'm here too i mean that's my thought about it i don't know maybe other folks have ideas about that but like that's like what i think about yeah i mean yeah i believe like folks like john eric parks finest and um all those folks um they have a good business model and they have fairly affordable prices mm -hmm. and certain like and certain they give days, back to the community yeah, they give back to the community all the time um yeah. And they I mean, give back by, um, just so folks know, like they usually are the catering for a lot of community events mm -hmm. and they do it at a very affordable price. And so, and they're always down if you need to host an event in their space, mm -hmm. they're, they're, their doors are open. So they definitely have the model. And, but it, in that model, it's because they're from there. Like yeah. John Eric and the other co owners, they're from that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a question to any of you. Um, if you, what do, you, what do you say to somebody who has lived in one of these neighborhoods that we mentioned, like uh, Stark Filipino Town, for example, um, and they've lived there their whole lives, and they lived through the gangs, the drive-bys, the drug, you know, drug trade. Um, oh, drug's not that bad, but... <laughs> <laughs> the bad drugs. <laughs> not the kind you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you say to them when they see their neighborhood getting better? And it's because of gentrification. But Obviously, they're, they, they have privilege. They own their property. They can stay there. But what do you say to them? What do I say to them? Or, you know, I mean, how do you talk to them? How do you? About these different do, issues. Yeah, well, what I guess, you, yeah. I mean, Ryan specifically, yeah. Yeah, you Atwater. know, from Atwater <laughs> yeah. and how things have changed so dramatically over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, What's the how do your parents react to that, actually? So what my celebrities are there. <laughs> <laughs> is it Leia Salonga? Is that what it is? <laughs> I saw Natalie Portman at one of the the cafes there. Oh. Yeah, I was like, Natalie Portman's hanging out in Outer Village. And you're like, I wish it was Leia Salonga. <laughs> Snap picture. Um, so what do I say to them? So so I think on I'm going to break it down into a couple of ways. Um, so we've been in out. Uh, my family's been in Outwater since 1987, right? And so, yes, we have experienced the changes. We never used to, we started walking around the block until, you know, after dinners, until we realized maybe that's not so safe <laughs> to do that. And then we're starting to see people walk around the block, which is amazing, right? So there's the, there's the initial reaction to the economic, like, property values going up. Things are happening in the neighborhood. It's popular. Those are all uh, effects, uh, effects of this um, uh, kind of neighborhood being developed developed yeah okay i don't want to call it revitalization i don't think it's necessarily a revitalization but you know there's now a new investment coming into the neighborhood whether it be home purchasing a lot of single family homes in atwater there's not a lot of apartments yeah but um uh investing in homes investing in the businesses there so on the on the forefront and uh, the very immediate kind of reaction like on the face value of it is like oh great there are a lot of effects to this. Now, the part that gets a little tricky is, you know, um, like what's now missing, right? And those are the things that I think it becomes the responsibility of folks who have lived there a long time to tell that story of what's now missing or what used to be. I love walking around at Water Village and talking about what used to be there. I don't know why I do it, but it's sometimes sad. So going back into this cafe where Natalie Portman was, I remember when it was Filipino owned. I remember when it was German owned, then Filipino owned. Uh, my classmate was, um, her mom owned the place. It's a bakery. And that's when a lot of more Filipinos and Latinos live there. And now it's a really popular place that I don't go to because I can't afford it. 
<laughs> Sometimes I'm like, wait, I'm going to buy a muffin for $5? No. You know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, so there's just there's just the the you can tell it's 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 real, it's palpable. On the investment stuff, it's it's fine, you know, like especially with, you know, my parents and my brother who owns a house, like, hey, that's great. Your property value's gone up. But on the on the culture side, I think is the part that's that's a little bit kind of either hidden, missing, or you just never knew it, it had a culture or it went away. Uh, and that's the part that kind of we struggle or I struggle with. Luckily, you know, some of my, my parents' friends still go to that same church and all that stuff. But, you know, folks have been have moved out and have been I don't know, for lack of a better word, been pushed out or priced out. Um, and I think that's the part where, you know, if you have lived there for a really long time and you have created culture and community there, you should be able to keep that going. And and that even saying that is is kind of difficult. Well, I think that's that's probably the most, I think as you used this word earlier, insidious part of mm-hmm. my understanding of gentrification because, I mean, I think, the idea behind some of the development or the theme behind a lot of it is that they think they're bringing something that the neighborhood has been missing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, especially when I think about what's happened in places like downtown LA, um, things that are, that they keep trying to do to what is MacArthur park, Mm Westlake, which isn't a Filipino community, but you know, people like to look at those communities and say like, look how blighted it is. Look how terrible it is. There's nowhere for people to shop. There's nowhere for people to go. But if you go down, if you went down Broadway in downtown, you know, the last couple of decades, it's full of a ton of people. They just happen to be Latino. It has to be Latino businesses. Right. Mm-hmm. You go to Westlake, you know, same thing, you know. Um, there are people well, shopping. There are people shopping, people not, living. It's a healthy community. Maybe not. It's not a, what people want it to a be. A middle class community, yeah. you know, maybe not a white community, but there are people there who are living some kind of version of right. a life with businesses that are part of their kind of social and economic ecosystem. Um, but that has somehow by the people who are coming in developing new things saying, you know, that is invalid mm-hmm. by this yeah. development. But I, I do want to also stress. So it's not just the individual part, right? Because I, I had stated previously the gentrification effects that you see now mm-hmm. are a result of like an entire mm-hmm. shift of a paradigm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, a history of just deregulation, right? Federal mm-hmm. deregulation, state de- deregulation, even local deregulation. So it's about kind of building wealth in a certain pocket of area. But why? Like, so so people are getting better loans. Certain types of people are getting better loans. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. everybody's getting better loans. Mm-hmm. But what, like, what's creating that, right? And I think that those are the bigger questions. Like, how, yeah. how do people get business loans? Right. That's another thing. What kind of mm-hmm. businesses are you going to loan to? And what's the business right. model? And... And also, what are the resources that go into the community that teach the community how to create a business model, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So SIPA did that. SIPA used to have, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, small business development. So they still do. Small they still do. Develop. Well, yeah. they still do. <laughs> um, and and so, I'm meeting but, with John next week. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, those things are important, right? Because how do you, if right. if you don't have the education, you don't have the the social capital, you don't know the people who can put you in touch with the people who can get you loans mm-hmm. or invest in your in whatever your idea is, you're not going to be able to grow in your community because mm-hmm. that's going to go to somebody mm-hmm. else. And the entire thing about the blight is that folks that do want to capitalize on this, they, they, uh, you know, it's even more favorable. The, the more blighted, the cheaper the land is going to be, or the cheaper yeah. everything's going to be. And then you can come in and then you can make the largest amount of profit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, like um, a friend of mine where we were saying you were growing up, the hip and happening place was Melrose, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone hung out like in high school in Melrose and you went down yeah. to Melrose, Melrose and Fairfax. And it's still like that, but I feel like a lot of that shifted like to Silver Lake. It did. Mm-hmm. A lot of the things that I feel like I see a bunch of high school students and I think to myself, I remember when I used to like hang out in Melrose, it was so mm-hmm. cool. All those kids from Fairfax High, so mm-hmm. awesome, right? You know, like things like that. <laughs> and it's, but it's, it's different now. It just keeps on shifting because you need to make more and more money. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I think that there is a regulatory scheme that doesn't exist that would help protect also communities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was just saying, I guess on top of that, there's a layer of, you know, racial inequity yeah. and just class inequity in general right. that kind mm-hmm. of colors all of it right. really. So I think, I mean, and that's why I think, you know, I thought the subject of gentrification and historic Filipino town, you know, was interesting just because, you know, to what degree does that kind of play into each other? The idea of like, what is a community you know, to what degree are ethnic enclaves either empowering or, you know, imprisoning in some ways, mm-hmm. you know, in what degrees is a community based upon 
you know, proximity versus culture mm-hmm. or the mix of yeah. the two. So, I mean, yeah. you know, there's so many different layers into it, but I mean, just the idea that you could even gentrify a place, um, basically is saying that that place isn't of value until mm-hmm. it gets this aspect of something else yeah. that only yeah. some people have access to anyways. So. Well, cause I've had, I've heard the conversation from folks who have survived like, like in historic Filipino town, right? Like who survived gang life, who survived the drugs and they're like, I welcome it. I want it to be there. I want the neighborhood to change. I, I, I want it to, I want it to be better. Mm-hmm. And, um, and even when you say like, but when it gets better, it's like you're we're erasing this part of our history. Like it's no longer our neighborhood anymore. Mm-hmm. And the reaction is, well, that's okay. Like it's okay that it's doing that because things need to change. Because I would much rather see this um, luxury apartment than an empty lot, or I would much rather see like luxury. It's another luxury apartment than an old carnation empty factory. You know, um, th- those are the folks who have been there and they're just willing to see the change because they don't want it to rot like it had been for like. 20 years so i don't know if there's a balance to it all. but i think that's also about community education and talking about what how land use can actually you be mm-hmm. used for your community and it's mm-hmm. and and again i would stress and why aren't folks in the community feeling empowered that they can do something right. in their community instead mm-hmm. of allowing you know a lot of people talk about gentrification as just kind of um, present-day colonialism mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. foreign investment or foreign dollars foreign being not from this community coming inside and now just spending a lot of money in there basically saying hey this was your land but you didn't know how to use it so now mm-hmm. we're just going to do it for mm-hmm. you and if you can't stay here right. because of that it's because you didn't really appreciate it yeah. mm-hmm. and i think that's the problem is if if you're saying that there are maybe a lot of um folks that were like yeah i want all this stuff to be there, but you, it should have been there for you to begin right, with. To yeah. Begin with. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what I was talking about. Like what's kind of incumbent upon like folks who have lived there for a really long time is how do you become a part of that conversation? Like, that conversation. Um, so uh, I, I want to pose this question to you guys. Uh, do you know your neighbors? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do well, you Joe? Well, the Filipino ones, <laughs> <laughs> even the non Filipino ones. Yeah, see, okay, you know yeah. them. I know the people across the street, but I don't like this. I don't like this white neighbor by that. <laughs> Hopefully they don't listen to the podcast. I, I doubt they listen to this Philippine version. <laughs> do you know your neighbors, Jen? I do know my neighbors. Okay. Um, but I mean, like I'm, I will straight up say I'm a gentrifier in my mm-hmm. neighborhood. I live by Virgil and Melrose, mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. would have been East Hollywood at some point, but now it's, it's Silver Virgil Lake. Village. Oh, Virgil Village. That's right. Silver Lake You're adjacent. <laughs> Silver Lake adjacent. East Beverly Hills. But even if you, even if technically you are a gentrifier, if you were originally from the neighborhood, no, 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 no. Oh. no I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying, if you were white, property value would rate would would Be increase raised? higher than say any of you three, like who have moved to those neighborhoods. So I'm saying, like, race has it definitely has a part in in it, yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, like so if I if I moved to a neighborhood, like it it, uh, it would I guess it would raise so the value five of a little us? bit, but. Um, if a white person moved in a neighborhood because of the cultural capital that comes with it. So what you're saying is the five of us, we're all working professionals, right? We're all working sure. young professionals. But if we move to a neighborhood, the property value doesn't increase because we aren't white. It well, wouldn't increase not as, as much. much. Not as much. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. That sucks. Yeah. I mean, like, so where I live, in my building, there are six units. There are six? There are six units in my building and I... Mm-hmm. Like one of like maybe three other tenants that might be a person of color, and mm-hmm. but everyone around us is like Latino, and I can tell you that the demographics and in that small slice of like Virgil Village, the vast majority of them, like ninety five percent are tenants, mm-hmm. and I like some of them I know because I've represented them in court, and I'll still see them, and they're still there, but it's like the stakes are so high at this point. Like everyone, yeah. if I, you know, like when I was doing eviction defense work, I. Um, you know, I was talking to a lot of other people in the defense bar. We are in a position where, like, we can't even do the move out offer because if I move you out, where are you going to move to? Mm-hmm. And far. It, yeah, really far. Even yeah. if you have a Section yeah. Eight Rancho voucher, Kukumanga. if you have a if you have a Section Eight voucher, if I move yeah. you out yeah. within the amount of time, no one's going to take your yep. Section Eight. That's right. People are not renting to Section Eight. People are trying to like just kind of get out of their Section Eight mm-hmm. yeah. um, contracts because they're just like, I don't want to deal with poor people anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, this is like sort of the situation that I'm seeing in historic Filipino town. I've, I've had to like talk to like, you know, 
my old boss used to call it the come to Jesus talk. I've had to talk to mm-hmm. tenants and be like, where are you going to move? I need you, like, you know, I want you to go tonight, look up places, and you tell me where you're going to move in a right. month, in mm-hmm. 60 days, in three months. And then they're going to tell me they're going to be, they're going to be houseless for a while. Right. They're going to live on somebody's couch, which is, you know, by the standards of the homelessness count, that's considered that's it's being your houseless. Yeah. yeah. You're, you don't have a home. You don't have a key to that apartment. You are staying because someone's letting you stay there. And that's, it's, it, it, this is sort of the situation we're in. Like there are a lot of people like that. Like you don't have to necessarily just be on the streets to be considered homeless. Right. Right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> and just for clarification, I work on homelessness in my day job. So, <laughs> Um, so yeah, we talked a lot about kind of the, the problems of gentrification. Mm-hmm. So, uh, maybe we can enlighten us about any kind of solutions, um, maybe beyond like an end of capitalism. So <laughs> <laughs> smash <know>. capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fight the patriarchy. I oh, mean, it's something we could do, like. <laughs> but I, I think it has to. I mean, you guys are yeah. doing civic engagement. Civic mm-hmm. engagement is really important. It's about like going to the. You hear that, guys? We're doing civic engagement. <laughs> well, I mean, like you know, particularly for the folks who sure. are working in in the government, and yeah. like you know, I think that people need to. Oh, inform. I thought you meant the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Well, that too. But like you know, go to the housing committee. Right. Talk to the council members. Hey, council member my neighbor is going to be kicked out and it's going to be really crappy because it's not just this neighbor, it's the entire building. Mm-hmm. They're being illegally Ellis. Can you do something? Ellis, can you explain that? So the Ellis Act is an act that allows essentially for a landlord who doesn't want to be a landlord anymore um, to get out of the business. And this is what a lot of folks did in San Francisco to mm-hmm. have converted these apartment buildings that were rent controlled. They said they were going to Ellis it, take it off the market but didn't really take it off the market and just start renting it, you know, market rate, whatever market rate is. Market rate is also this like, not a Arbitrary real thing. Yeah. So not a real thing. So, and you see this a lot with Airbnb. I mean, it could be mm-hmm. in your individual level, if you know someone who's coming to LA, you should be like, don't use Airbnb. Go to a union hotel, please. Like, you know, do something yeah. like that. Like, I know it's more expensive, but like your Airbnb, Airbnb and your need to be in Silver Lake right now might displace somebody who's been living there for like 40 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are, those are again, just individual choices, but we also need to have, there's going to be an ordinance about short-term rentals. Mm-hmm. Like that mm-hmm. needs to pass through because we need to protect the, you know, the RSO housing stock that we do have. And RSO is the rent stabilization yeah. ordinance. Yeah. Um, How about I, the argument that some politicians, uh, elected officials use that we just need to build more housing? Because isn't as as isn't that a conversation that we've had in this city? I mean, no, it's specific to Los Angeles, but I think it's nationwide that yeah. there's a housing shortage um, across many metropolitan areas. Yeah. So, what about that argument? What do you think so about you, that, Mike? Say what you. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll let Jen answer that. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a I think it's a fallacy, and I think it's you're you're doing it because you want to get more money. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. if we had to look at the different, what like how much. Everyone talks about the vacancy rate in downtown, right? But why are we continuing to build luxury housing? Why aren't we building affordable housing mm-hmm. that would remain affordable? And I think this goes back to the whole fact that we don't have public housing anymore. And mm. we're not going to have public housing. And all we have now are tax credit buildings mm-hmm. and Section 8 mm. vouchers. And we, you know, we're, we're passing things to create affordable housing and mm-hmm. permanent supportive housing. However, I think what I've talked to some planners about, I don't really buy this trickle down like theory. Mm -hmm. When has trickle down ever happened? When has it ever worked out in this, like in the span of the history of we understand trickle down? I mean, it's literally going to trickle. (laughs) When it rains, it trickles down I mean, it's literally going to trickle down, but by the (laughs) time it happens, by the time we have a glut and like a bust, all the people are going to be gone that need to be housed. Hmm. Hmm, this is get, turning real dark. <laughs> well, no. no, I mean it's a dark subject, right? Yeah, it is. And then there's been there's been um, I guess some some people have tried to push like inclusionary zoning, mm-hmm. right. but that got kind of that got like uh, shut or well, no, there's out, actually right? a, a fix in the state. Um, it's called the Palmer Fix. I think okay. it's AB fifteen oh five, and it's it's passed through. I think it passed through the assembly right now. So I don't know where. So it's a bill in progress. It's a bill in progress. But this is also the thing that we need to shift this idea about like housing isn't the thing you might be able to have if you afford it. Like housing is a human right. Yeah. I think that's the other part. Wow. I didn't, I don't even think of it that way. (laughs) Because you know, it's one of those things like 
But that's also when you talk about the deregulation of education, it's the same thing. You yeah. privatize everything, mm-hmm. and then we're get, we're basically you go back to the whole like theory about bootstrapping. Well, if this person worked hard exactly. enough, they would have housing. Yeah. Like no, well sometimes things happen and people don't get the resources that they need and they don't have the community to support mm-hmm. them. So we're going to have to figure that out. And mm-hmm. and that's something that we did like post World War II. Like we had all these different like the New yeah. Deal stuff that things happen and and we built things. But now we're like, but we still need benefited to build. white suburbanites. Unfortunately. It did, unfortunately. Yeah, 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 but like yeah. at the same time, though, the, we need to rethink that yeah. and in a racial justice lens yeah. mm-hmm. and understand not just in a racial justice lens, but like in a socioeconomic like, tip, just like how do we balance that? And I mm-hmm. think what's interesting about like what we're all like in our 30s. And now I'm we're 29, not. 29, yo. <laughs> still, <laughs> Joe, still. Still? No. Uh, Been 29. there a while, bro. But I, mean, but I think, like, I have this conversation yeah. with a lot of people. Like, we're now in places where we can actually weigh in mm-hmm. in yeah. these conversations that can change the way that our civic leaders do things. Or you can be the civic leader that's like the champion for housing. Right. Ryan, yeah. you can go ahead and do that. <laughs> like, I want to go back to the water. But I mean, that's. Go ahead, Joe. No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, you know, that's kind of what, what's important about um, the work that you do, Mike, the work that you do, Jen, and folks who have actually been discussing, you know, policy and changes and really about access, right? You know, access to just that information. And it, it, there's a reason, for example, why when we talk about, you know, our Filipinos are, you know, uh, aware that this is happening or Filipino Americans are aware that um, policy is being created around them and not including them. Um, and so, you know, if we have the ability to share that information with our our folks, we should. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're right. We should be attending some of these meetings. Um, we should be inviting people to, to come and, and speak speak out. And part of that is just understanding that, you know, without without that access or even that um, that push, we're never going to we're always going to be complacent. You know, we're always going to have the, the folks who are going to welcome, you know, Re- development in their in their neighborhoods yeah. without fully understanding why that's happening mm-hmm. and you know before long you know this is the 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 speed in which things are happening in in various cities in the united states it's it's ridiculous and it's by design mm-hmm. and that's i think what jen was trying to say is like a lot of this was designed to happen and designed to keep up with the joneses in terms of like prop profit and 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 continuing to profit and yeah. continue to profit and a lot of filipinos like you know, they earn their money by buying and selling houses. Right. Like, right? Um, yeah. That's yeah, there's a whole class of Filipinos in L.A. that was, was built that way yep. yeah. from previous, you know, housing crashes. But I mean, and that, but they helped develop the community. And so uh-huh. there are always kind of two sides to that mm-hmm. coin that, mm-hmm. you know, you can build a community through development, gentrific- gentrification, quote unquote. But, you know, I mean, to what degree are, you know, the money class and the working class, you know, engage with each other. Yeah. And yeah. and the way that it's moving now, it just seems like again, you know, to use the word Jen used earlier, colonialism and yeah. people setting up shop and not engaging, you know, from outside forces coming in and, you know, no conversation about like how do how do we how do we become a community? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Housing is a human right. That's right. Um mm-hmm. real quick, uh I just wanted to get your opinions on uh more I guess uh, more aggressive tactics to curb gentrification, so, or at least put uh, put more attention to it, mm-hmm. such as like the defend Boyle Heights. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you all know about what defend Boyle Heights. It's basically a bunch of housing rights advocates who have uh, actively protested in front of art galleries. They, they targeted art galleries. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I've had some friends involved with that. Yeah, and um, and uh, it's very you know. I, I don't say it. it's aggressive, right? Yeah. In nature. Um, it's like grassroots though. Grassroots. It targets, uh, uh art galleries who are not, you know, not from the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so yeah. What, what, any opinions on that or, I mean, I think that people feel threatened and they mm-hmm. feel upset mm-hmm. and, um, are upset by the current political situation in our city where they feel like, you know, mm-hmm. people have money, get to do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. You're only going to fix the things in Boyle Heights because of this money here, and then I think that this is this is this is kind of the way in which organizing is occurring to be like, no, you should have done this from the from the jump. You mm-hmm. shouldn't have waited 
for these gallery spaces. And if these gallery mm-hmm. spaces are going to be here and think that we're not going to be unhappy about it and you haven't engaged us meaningfully, mm-hmm. I think they have the right to do that. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I know that there are a bunch of different groups and I, I think that it's interesting because it's happening outside of this nonprofit industrial con- like complex. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And it's grassroots. So I, I think that, I mean, it, it is aggressive, but so is like coming into a neighborhood course, and yeah. like displacing a bunch of people. Yeah. It's just that like you don't see it immediately. I, I mean, I don't know all the talking points. I, I know that I've legal observed for some of their marches. Um, and I know like so has other, other folks in the like the guild. Um, but I, I don't know necessarily is there a right or wrong way to mm-hmm. respond. And mm-hmm. I think that this is what's important about that it's creating a conversation right. mm-hmm. and yeah. it is making people feel uncomfortable. And I right. think we need to be uncomfortable. Right and it's, now. Yeah. that's what oh I way. actually like. Yeah. It's a way, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. we, I mean, we have, figured, you know, like there's folks who are actually doing stuff about it. So yeah. that's a way to do a, do yeah. it. Um, it might not be the only way, but I'm kind of envious of the, the fact that folks are able to do this. Right. We we're talking about it today. Like there's folks who are just sitting down, accepting some of these challenges, whether it be because they don't have access to government um, but the fact that folks have kind of like from from the ground up been able to to say, hey, we want to defend our neighborhood. I think that's I think that's great. Yeah, and as Joint Jen pointed out earlier, I mean, like you know, she's doing some of this work in Filipino town because you know who else is going to do it? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and we do we do interact and connect with a lot of the nonprofits in the area, but none of them are really centered around this idea of or have the resources yeah. to do it. You know, Search and all Filipino Americans is down the street mm-hmm. from us. Filipino Worker Center is where me and Jen do some of our work. Um, there's other nonprofits, but I mean, none of them have really kind of the ability or even kind of, you know, wouldn't even know where to start with kind of this specific issue. And I, I and I'm curious, I mean, maybe people can, people can respond on our Facebook or whatever, like, you know, are, are there groups, you know, maybe focused on Filipinos, Filipino Americans, um, and housing rights? Yeah. You know? so, some can in yeah. San Francisco, mm. San Francisco, South of market area. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I think it, it, it is like Ryan was saying that we just have to have multiple strategies, right? Yeah. People need to organize and then other people who get, who have the ability to do policy, they right. need to put in policy that can change what we have in place. You can't mm-hmm. just, like we have, like everything, it might not even be completely coordinated, mm-hmm. but like if there are folks out there who have like the ear to the council or something, mm-hmm. then you, you know, mm-hmm. like craft those things, yeah. write those things, yeah. get those things in there, get those things passed, make it a motion, make the council, like look at what's going on. You know, like everybody has a right to be in Los Angeles if they want to be here. And we have to really think about what do we mean by a city? Like, do we want a gilded city like a San Francisco that only caters to folks in the tech industry mm-hmm. or do we value diversity Mm -hmm. and diversity means not just like race, but also class class. yeah, Yeah. and religion and things like that. Like it, it can't be just this monolithic thing because it doesn't actually help in terms of the education. It doesn't help in, in any of those things. Hmm. I'm low income in San Francisco. I think we're all alone. I think we're like poor in San Francisco. I, mean, I have a roommate. I live in LA. Okay. I have a roommate too. I live in LA. I rent from my parents. <laughs> Ryan? I you don't rent. have a roommate. I rent. You're the one who wins. <laughs> what do I win? Uh, do I win? You win uh, not you know, number one gentrifier. Oh, <laughs> <that crew. laughs> Ryan, you're the winner. You're the winners. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jen, yeah. for coming here and yes. enlightening us on uh, the issues of gentrification. It's very tough. Yes, we're all part of it. It's it's not gonna um, it's not gonna solve one. That's all. It won't be happening overnight. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I mean, just like, remember, he, you know, housing is a human right. Housing yeah. is a human right. I think that um, Mike came down to my office the other day and we had lunch, and he was telling me about there are things about LA that I'm really nostalgic about. And I was like, let's not be nostalgic about things and let's do things. So like yeah. things kind of still exist in the space that we understand them and yeah. not like, and, and I do think that things get to change, but I think that we, as citizens of the city, we get to also have our input as, yeah. as totally. to how they change. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm nostalgic about when this one street didn't have bike lanes and there were two lanes in the street. <laughs> 
it was amazing because more cars could come by. But Tang then this, George this guy, Villanueva. George Villanueva. Hi, anyway, George. Anyway, it's a whole other topic. Uh, hi, George. You ruined right. um, this one street in Los Angeles. I defend uh, you, George. <laughs> but um, thank you all for listening. Um, we just wanted to give a shout out to our TFL fan of the episode, Rianne Fajardo, for Yay. being one of our Patreons. Um, for folks who are listening, you can support TFL by being a, t- a Patreon of our podcast. Uh, you would go to patreon.com slash TFL podcast and you can make a monthly donation to support our show and subscribe and rate us on iTunes so people can find us. If you put in Filipino, we are the second thing that comes up on iTunes. It's the first thing. Um, sometimes some, it's the third, sometimes the fourth. Oh, it really? Yeah. It's usually like learn Tagalog or something like that. Oh, screw that. <laughs> just listen to us. <laughs> and then um, you can also find us on Mixcloud. Uh, you can make a one-time donation to us and uh, if you email this Life at gmail.com I will let you know uh, what other things what other things what other that's things it. that's it <laughs> that's it this is it we're about to end Mike do you have anything to say what are you talking about I don't about? know <laughs> I don't this know this is it this is it <laughs> do, 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 do. let's all pretend we're Kenny Loggins and Michael McDonald this no let's, let's not <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for what listening what is happening right now <laughs> I don't Thank know. You. Elaine's going crazy. Thanks, you, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This Filipino American life is produced by Michael Maila. Our intro and outro music is by Roger Habon, aka Ten Point Four Raj. Resident reality checker Gurley Colado. Legal advisor Rianne Fajardo, and graphic design by Vincent Collier.